<laughs> All right. We're here to talk about dreams of love, etc. today. <laughs> Are you the etc? Am I the etc? <laughs> <laughs> it's such a like a poetic title, but then the comma etc. <laughs> like it's quite the juxtaposition here. It kind of gives you a little bit of a head scratch, and I love it. I right from the beginning, you know, I'm already off put, which is a you know a good way I think to start off your reader because it gets you thinking. Well, put it in your calendar. Three years from now. <laughs> In 2026, uh, Picador will actually publish this in a short story collection actually called Dreams of Love, etc. So looking forward to that. But right now we're just talking about the short story. Um, OK, so how do we get started with this one? Because it's not about plot, right? This is, this is very open ended and the plot is a way to step through this. And I guess one of the things that kind of stood out to me was the musical element of it. I, I don't know if we've ever talked about this, but Miyako Kawakami is uh, an ex singer, right? She quit singing to start writing full time, you know, decades ago. So she gets that idea of being dedicated to something. And that could be a hobby, it could be a passion. You know, in this story, it's gardening. In her life, it was singing. The neighbor in the story is playing piano. The idea of, dedicating and putting so much time into improving one particular skill or aspect of your life. I think that's something many of us can relate to. Definitely. I think it's that idea of what is the saying master of none, jack of all trades thing. It's kind of like that of if you dedicate yourself to one thing, what do you give up in other aspects of your life? Or if you spread yourself too thin, what do you give up by becoming a perfection of one thing? And that is mm -hmm. pretty deep. Mm -hmm. Jack, Jack of all trades, master of none. Yeah, um, that's it. <laughs> so, you know, Kawakami is not new to, it's not even just like a, a simple phrase. It's not, she's not just a, a turn of the cheek person. She, she does read philosophy. Um, there, there was that uh, reference that she had, that book, Heaven, which was heavily steeped in nihilism and dealt with a lot of Nietzsche will to power theories and stuff like that. The opening of this one, what makes a rose a rose? It's the metaphysics question of what makes someone something. And, and that, that interplays very well with that dedication to the hobby, right? Because, you know, you hear about people who might lose their jobs and it devastates them. Right. Because they didn't realize how much of their self-worth and value was tied up in that thing that's called careers. And then when that's taken away from them, they feel empty. Right. Like that was part of their identity. And you see how people create these hobbies and other things. And it can be similar, but it's also choices that they make. These are things that I can choose to do, which is why when you see people like, like get injured and can't do the sport that they love, it, it sometimes makes them very cantankerous. Right, because it's it's destroying part of their identity sometimes. A lot of ways I can go with this. So first of all, I, I think about this of is this kind of a East versus West philosophy of where I feel like a lot of times people that I know and myself in particular, as you said, we define ourselves by our careers, by our jobs. I know that when you introduce yourself and meet somebody, what what's one of the first questions you ask your name? And then mm -hmm. what's the second question you almost always ask? What do you do? Yeah, what do yep. you do? And almost everybody answers with their career. Not I'm a dad or, you know, I'm, you know, a gardener in this instance. Uh, but it's always your career. We almost always in the United States define ourselves by our jobs in some capacity. And while that's important, and maybe some people take it as too much importance, at least I know I did, of that your job is who you are, or you are your job. I taught school for 19 years, and when I gave that up, did I stop being who I am? No, but I think that that idea of are you your hobbies? Am I a Star Wars nerd? Am I a book nerd? Uh, you know, am I a YouTube star? <laughs> I wish. Um, <laughs> I, I think that you you can pick and choose what you want your life to be defined as. Do you want it to be your career? That's fine. Or you do do you want it to be your hobbies? And that's fine as well. But I think that if it becomes to a point of unhealthiness, that's where it becomes a, a, an issue. And I think that the story kind of lends itself to that idea of, where does a hobby end or begin and you as a person end or begin? Mm -hmm. 
Now, she even complicates it a little bit because we have the idea of trauma, right? With this big Japanese tsunami, obviously a very specific thing to their country. But we we can see how things in the East right now with, with Russia, Ukraine, there are large traumatic events that can come along that, that just drastically change your life and everyone around you, right? And Japan was having the discussion of, you know, even like she talks about how mixed couples, right? Some wanted to leave Japan because they didn't view being in Japan as part of their identity. But, you know, Kawakami brings up that there were local Japanese that are like, no, we have to be here. This is who we are. And you start to see how when trauma creeps into our lives, well, that can even impact a lot of our identity as well. Because you see in the story, the narrator starts to specifically just pick up roses started to get a collection, and that's how she got into gardening. But at the same time, I don't think she viewed it as part of her identity totally. You know what I mean? Like, there are layers into this in which we step. Because she had that fantasy about how, oh, if someone broke into my house and destroyed things, my neighbors would be like, oh, she loved gardening so much, but did she? Or was that just a way of not dealing with some of the trauma, a way of forcing normalcy back into your life? That sometimes that's what hobbies are doing, is giving you routine and normalcy. And what you really love is that, and not necessarily the hobby itself, is another complicated layer. Ooh, that's good. Because I think that a lot of times, by definition, life-defining moments are life and death moments and something like a tsunami or a war or whatever that dramatically changes your life that's something that is going to alter the course of your life and then if it doesn't feel good it doesn't feel natural you're not happy anymore maybe you revert back to those things that gave you happiness before you are trying to find that sense of normalcy and hobbies are great ways of doing that because it's something that you can take and relate to other people. And then you're going to compare yourself to those people and say, all right, they're doing these things and they look happy on the outside. So if I do these things as well, gardening, watching movies, writing, riding a horse, whatever, then maybe I can have that again too, because my psyche is broken, broken because of this life changing event that was literally life or death. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Now, with that said, as human beings, we're smart. Sometimes we trick ourselves. Sometimes we don't. <laughs> right? But just, just step with me on that one, all right? <laughs> okay, 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 okay. Other human Let's beings, it, not us. <laughs> <laughs> Let's put it this way. There are some people that know when they're fooling themselves. Okay. This narrator, where is she on that scale? Because... There's clearly, I think, some type of a disconnect between what she thinks and what she says and behaves. Now, part of that, of course, is the Japan and the basic you know, individualism differences there with how you're expected to perform a certain way and to step in line and not step out of bound. But the way that like she knows she's going out and buying cherries, but then knows that that's probably a little bit too forward. So she's like, oh, I'm regifting these. She knows she doesn't enjoy listening to her play the piano, but then sits up and claps and applauds to be polite and show camaraderie with a friend. There, there's something to be said how Kawakami clearly draws a difference between how the person feels inside and how they exhibit themselves externally. And that's the idea of social cues, right? That I think that a lot of us sometimes pick on be be better than others. Where if you're in a situation and you're like, all right, this is the way I'm supposed to behave, so I'm going to do that. Otherwise, I'm going to be rude or disrespectful. Is is that okay if you're deluding yourself with that? Is that lie? Is that the one of those white lies that's acceptable that we're allowed to tell ourselves to make ourselves feel better? I don't know, but I feel like that she does it flawlessly. Uh, is is, is is Bianca none the wiser for this? Does she know that she's terrible at playing the piano in front of her friend? Probably, but does she feel better that her friend lies to her to make the situation more palatable? I think so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's another interesting thing about their names, like Terry and Bianca, the way that Terry, you know, completes this piano lesson and she takes on the pseudonym. I think it's a pseudonym of Bianca. They're almost continuing to play along with that theme that we were just talking about of a separation of identity, a separation of internal and external. And it, it's playful, but also very puzzling at the same time, too. And also, this is 
kind of mundane, right? I mean, this is a lady gardening, which again, nothing against gardeners. My wife has all the succulent plants. I've posted them on Discord. Uh, but it's something that's very not exciting, <laughs> I think, mm -hmm. for some people. And playing the piano, and again, unless you are, you know, have 11 fingers and you're hitting the ivory in front of, you know, a concert hall, for some people, it's a very simple thing of just playing the piano. These are not extravagant lifestyles. This is something that is very simple that a lot of us can relate to. And I think that that's important of these two people coming together with their very simple lives and, and trying to form a bond or relationship of some sort. I, I think that's right. important. And, and whether... And whether they're coming together to create normalcy, like we talked about earlier with hobbies to avoid trauma, you know, there's a lot to discuss there, but let's, I think we agree that while mundane, mundanity, what's the word there, <laughs> how, how everything is so <laughs> mundane through this story, uh, that kiss that suddenly happens, right? Kawakami is very surgical with her words where she says they, they kiss, what was it with like, with everything that they have, right? So we can't write it off as just a fake, as a mistake. Like they really did believe in it in that moment. But then there's that immediate pullback, right? Where, where we have what actually happened and then we have how we feel, but it's not shame. It's not uh, awkwardness. There, there's something about the, the sudden return to normalcy that they both seek where that excitement and the sudden shock of the kiss, you know, breaking into their normal repetitive lights that are lives was very shocking for them and the narrative, and I think ultimately reinforces the repetitive nature of everything else in their lives. You know me. I loved this part of the story because this is life emulating a book, emulating life, peaks and valleys. You have your mundane, you're, you're going in your valley, and then you have something exciting happen in your life that shakes things up that you love. And poosh, you get that valley or that peak and you go up and then you go back down. And that's exactly what happens here. You get something that is thematic. And that is something that I think drives a lot of our lives is when you have your mundane valley, you work your job every day, you look for that vacation. You look for that 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 peak that is going to keep driving you forward until you get the next peak. And I think that's what this kiss does for them. Mm. You know, another thing that's kind of worth just mentioning that I love about Kawakami's writings is the way that she takes something big, like like the, the tsunami event, and how it plays a small effect at some level for, for everyone's lives in Japan. And, and then you have something small, like mastering the performance of a piece for a piano that can be everything to one person's life, right? The, the, the way that the big and the small interact with each other and how those those give meaning and drive to someone, I think is something that we can all kind of relate to too. I think it's also something that I felt that I pulled out of the story was the camaraderie of these two and how friendships can be based on nothing because they don't seem to have anything in common besides just having a hobby. One is a gardener and one is a pianist. But when when Bianca plays so terribly and, and Terry kind of forgives her for that, do you think that there's a level of compassion there that is something that we can take away of a lesson is even if your friend is terrible at something, you're going to support them no matter what. And that that shows through in how this relationship is budding and, 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 and blooming. Huh? See what it did there? <laughs> uh, well, the flowers did wither away in the end. So I did take Aww. that as the just <laughs> Oh, you ripped that think, out um, from me. Come on, Una. And I think Terry, I think technically Terry was the piano player and Bianca was the narrator, but I don't know. I, I maybe oh, I got to get backwards. that backwards. Okay. Uh, it, you know, at the end, it doesn't really matter because they're to they're all made up anyways. <laughs> <laughs> all right, guys, we're going to leave a playlist of other Kawakami talks down below. We're, we love her writing and are just kind of cruising through all of her work. Let us know in the comments down below what else you would like to hear uh, us cover next. My name's been Una. Peace. Peace.